Okay, uh, welcome to Six Scale, everybody. It's August 26th. Uh, the link to the design or to the, the me notes is in the, um, the chat. Um, add yourself as an attendee, please. Okay, um, so today's agenda. Um, first item um, is shared dashboard location. Um, I, I thought of this after last meeting. Kind of, I after um, we we kind of had um, from what I could tell, there's like we've had a bunch of dashboards that people have created um, around some of the metrics that we've had, and I, I was just wondering because I was looking around, I was seeing, uh, I was looking at the Qverts uh, repo for dashboards, and <clears throat> I wasn't. It didn't look like there was some of the um, the dashboards that people were showing that were pretty cool. That it didn't look like they were merged into that. Qvert repo, and so I just wanted to bring up the idea, like if you know, if it seemed like that might be a, a case, that, a place that we could all share uh, dashboard ideas and um, things that people are looking at. Um, I mean, does that make sense? Like, what do people think? Like, is it does it make sense? Like, how if, if we had some sort of uh, GitHub repo that we could have had a bunch of dashboards that that we could all share around this stuff? Yes, yes please. And, and actually. <laughs> There is a repository for that. Um, I was planning to, uh, to, you know, to submit the dashboard that uh, I'm using for the counter plane there. There is a dashboard for the VM's um, uh, metrics, but it's it's missing the 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 the, mat you know, the, the, the metrics that we have for the counter plane. Um, I, I will submit a, a PR for that. It's a Kubevirt. I don't remember now if it's it's here in our document it's some somewhere let me check this the link again um, um is, yep go ahead yeah what one one i i, I tried a few of those dashboards that are in the kubert ci and one important point i would like to see for the shared dashboard location is that uh, we document how to or we make sure the dashboards are properly exported and that they are compatible with either Grafana um, operator or just like export them as the JSON and not as some custom resource so we can import them into any Grafana because I, I couldn't import most of the dashboards. I had to copy the JSON out of the dashboard and that didn't work. And um, yeah, was, and then I just create my own. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is yeah, like, true. Like so. Like what I could see is like like when we're doing some of the like the measurements you know for our for our pull requests and um, like you know we're we're trying to say okay this improves performance you know uh, of some sort um, I mean we we can you know it's good to see it in the tool it's also good to see it uh, have a visual and have her have the opportunity to show visual a visual as well and like if if we have an easy way to do that I think it sort of increases the like likely likelihood that someone will include those dashboards you know, without you know, without having to do like a whole lot of work. We can just, you know, paste them into or import them into, into it with a make cluster up and, and import it and then and then take screenshots and it might make it a lot easier. So I, so this is the link that we have. Uh, this is like where where we can use uh, and this like where we have the current dashboard set. Oh, and uh, uh, a yeah. note because yes. I, I shared a few of those rain tank uh, dashboards and somebody asked if we can host that ourselves. I looked that up and rain tank is just any Grafana instance. So you can um, set up like we wanted, we, we want a, a Kubernetes Grafana anyways, we can set that up in a way that it can also receive snapshots. And uh, we can, instead of taking screenshots, we can actually share snapshots to the Kubernetes Grafana instead. And so the Kubernetes Grafana, Grafana, is that like from the CI jobs Grafana? Like that's what? That's how we. That's what it's for. Like, what's the what gets posted there? I think it was the original intention that we record. That we have Grafana showing all the CI at the metrics we collect in CI runs. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm pending that. Yeah, I, I will do that. Okay. So how for, so for now we can maybe we can start with this just so we have a shared location and then eventually like if we have this place that uh, we with CI dashboards. Um, we can start taking some of the dashboards that we've created here and adding them to um, that Grafana um, 
jobs so that we can grab snapshots mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, Cause yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, yeah, to have. Okay, so that, that sounds good. So we can correct, well, let's collaborate here. So I, I guess, let's, so let, whenever we're doing, I think there's one of the takeaways there is that if we have a place that we can collaborate on this, if we're doing some sort of, if we're adding a metric of some sort and you know it's, it warrants a dashboard, um, let's make sure we have a, a follow-up PR here to the dashboard of some sort, or at least just open an issue to do it um, so that we can mm -hmm. make sure that if we're adding this stuff, let's, let's have some sort of dashboard that we can share along with it make use of this yeah. and as a future at some point in the future if we build like a general cuber dashboard or, or multiple of those dashboards are also useful to admins um it might be an idea to publish those to the grafana marketplace from github so people search grafana for hey i want a cuber dashboard and they just get one officially suggested huh okay Okay, so yeah. I mean, there's a lot of lot of places we can go mm -hmm. with this. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, uh, let's move to the second item. Um, so uh, API priority and fairness. I had mentioned this last time. So I wrote um, a document about um, with some testing that I did and some information about this. Um, so I'll, let me talk through this for maybe about ten minutes or so. Um, so the uh, the API priority and fairness is. Um, was introduced uh, in alpha um, in Kubernetes 118. It's beta in 120. Um, so it's enabled by default. Um, and basically API and uh, priority and fairness is it's gonna allow the Kubernetes API server to um, to protect itself from any sort of um, misbehaving services in the cluster. So any sort of thing that could possibly cause some sort of denial of service. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, that we can sort of um, do with this and, and, and like the, the way that um, it can be leveraged to like the sort of the rate limiting aspect of it, it can be distributed uh, or can be um, can be tagged to or broken down by API calls or um, basically by the RBAC rules, by user, by verb, everything. Um, and you can create policies around all these things to do some, some form of rate limiting um, in, in just a really granular way. So it's, it's actually really cool. And so in addition to protecting the API server, you can do other things like um, protecting um, uh, a user from from another or from another user or protecting like some sort of API, like whatever it is from, you know, if you're a big user of an API, you know, giving yourself priority by user or or making sure that, that a, those APIs get through at higher priority. And so there's a lot of things that we can, we can do with this. And so the idea is that Kubert um, in, in newer clusters uh, could have a policy by default, just like Kubernetes does, um, to make sure that its traffic, uh, the control plane traffic is not interrupted. So I'll talk through a little bit of what this concept is. And then um, kind of my goal is that um, if we can kind of get to this kind of an understanding of what this is and maybe we can discuss how, um, you know, what that policy could be. And it probably will, this may end up I think it's likely to end up as a milling right? But just to give you guys an introduction to the topic, I'll, I'll talk through this here. So uh, the first thing is the, there's two APIs that come with this. It's, there's this flow control and the priority level configuration. Um, the flow control is is um, basically the set of rules like that define um, what's going to be regulated by the priority level configuration. Um, uh, so this is sort of like the what, like what's going to be rate limited. Just kind of think of it like that. Um, priority level configuration defines a number of outstanding requests, limitations, and number of queued requests for a flow control. It's kind of think about this as like um, how something will be, how something can get rate limited. So um, the number of queues and all these other things, these configurations will affect the priority and um, if requests can get rejected and, and all sorts of things like that. So here's a, an example just to give you a, a taste of this. So a flow control, um, this, this example is, a, it will capture uh, VMI's list requests um, for this service account, lister zero um, from this namespace. And um, you can see like some things in here, like there's, um, uh, here's the priority level configuration it defines um, and the rules, it looks a lot like RBAC. So we can uh, specify on API level um, the resource, um, the verbs, everything. And 
those subjects like the service accounts or you can do all, all users if you want to, uh, the namespace of it. Um, so it gets pretty granular in terms of what you want to control. Um, so what's important here is that there's sort of a one-to-many relationship and that you can, um, every flow control can list, um, they have many flow controls that list the same priority level configuration. Um, and so this plays sort of a, a role in how the, the fairness algorithm works, which I can um, talk to after I talked about what the, the PLC is here. So the, uh, the example priority level control here um, that, that is referenced uh, above, this is, uh, has a few fields. Um, we have ensured concurrency shares. Uh, kind of the way to think about this is there's like a calculation that happens um, on the Kubernetes API server side that determines the number, how much concurrency you can have, how many, how many outstanding requests you can have. Um, it's, it's based on the number of max in-flight requests and um, another flag. There's, there's two flags that, that basically determine how many uh, requests at once the API server can handle. And it's, there's a calculation that takes those values into account and, and this value. Um, and that will determine how many concurrency uh, shares you can have. Um, so that's basically your priority is the way to think about it. And then there's um, the, uh, the configure for how you will be, how you can create load. the number of queues, the queue length limit and the hand size. Um, queues, uh, this is pretty intuitive. So like, you know, the note thing about just the number of lists, the lengths of those lists and size. This is um, the, this is part of the fairness algorithm. Hand size is referring to kind of like a, I think it comes from the uh, like cards, like a deck of cards and figure to have however many in your hand. But the, the way to think about this is the, um, the definition of it is that the, this is the number of queues that a flow control can end up in. Um, and what's important about that is, um, uh, and this algorithm is that, uh, let me see, I actually want to see, oh, here we go. I think I have a link, but I'll show you that was a good picture of it. So the idea is that, um, here's a good picture. So when there are a lot of heavy um, users that are um, accessing a bunch of different queues, the idea is you want to distribute those users um, uh, to different queues. But the, the problem is, is that you don't want, um, you sort of don't want to end up in the wrong queue. So hand size is the number of queues that you'll end up in. So that number was four. So in that example, so for the example here is that you'd end up in four of these boxes. Your, your request would, can end up in four of them. And statistically, the probability of you sharing one of those boxes with a heavy user, let's say if you, um, let's say like the rainbow here or something like, if, if, the, if the rainbow is a heavy user, it's going to clog up these queues. But if you're across four boxes, then you'll have, you'll, you'll, your request will eventually get through. So you're not gonna be um, run over by someone that's got a lot of requests coming through. You'll eventually get um, attention from the API server. Um, and there's some whole probability about this um, in this table. Um, there's, a, there's a good document kind of explaining what this is. And, but basically, if you see here, like the hand size and the number of queues, um, and you can see that like based on the number of high intensity users, it's the probability that um, they'll squish a low intensity user. And you can see how, um, and based on the number of queues and the hand size, um, the numbers can, can vary. Okay, um, so the so with that in mind, like you can, we want we want to have a lot of um, well, actually, let me go back up for a second. So the the idea with the this this shuffle shard algorithm is that the we want to have um, we want to have a lot of um, workers. We want to have a lot of flow controls. Those are like the workers and the um, for the for the algorithm. So we want to have a lot of them. Um, we want them distributed, and but we also want to make sure we have a responsible number of queues um, as well, and the right amount of queue length. They all have different behavior. Queue length, um, the way it was described, is that they, it's better for burst requests, so they don't get rejected. They can pile up in the queue, and uh, but all this stuff though uh, does cost more memory. Like when you, and so the number of queues that need to be maintained and um, and so forth, it does it does use more memory. 
So something to consider, but the ultimate result though, is that uh, we don't we don't run over completely the, the API server with all these requests, which is what would happen if we just were um, sort of, uh, if we weren't blocked at all, we just let um, the API server just be overrun with, you know, thousands or of requests, list requests or something like that, something very heavy um, until it just ran out of memory. Um, are there any questions on this though, before I go to like the, uh, the next, I have a few tests that I'll talk through. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, what's yeah, the uh, default protection mechanisms that the API server has in place? There's gotta be some sort of way that it's protecting itself, I would hope. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can find. Yeah, there are, uh, um, if I can get the, uh... yeah, so here um, are a few, let's see, where are you? So the, by default, um, the, you can see here, like the, um, there are a bunch of queues that are a bunch of flow schemas that are created um, and they all share, uh, they're all workers in this workload high uh, priority level configuration, which is here. So the control plane protects itself by using um, this priority level configuration. Well, what's the default for just normal, not Kubernetes core components, but let's say Qvert, for example, if it's content in the API server, what, where did, okay, the catch all? And yeah. that, uh, okay. So that yeah, would, you get down that here, caught up in these. Regardless of, of what, how the system's configured, the catch all, we would fall under that. So we would be yeah. limited by the catch all. Okay. So we wouldn't overrun the API server if we fall into the catch all, which is a low priority. Is that accurate? Or am I? Yeah, like, so you're gonna, you're going to get, um, you're gonna get into the catch all. I, well, see, I haven't tried this with the catch all. It's a good question. I, like you get, you get into the low priority. Um, I think what you'll end up with is a, is a ton of rejected requests. You can see there's no queues. I mean, it's, I haven't tried this with none, but the, there's no queues and there's no hand size and no queue length. Um, so I think maybe you get rejected. Um, but I, what I mean by overrunning the, the, um, the API server, I mean in the case prior to having this, like having free reign, if there was no sort of API priority. Error. So in the case of the catch all, um, I would expect that these are, these are rejected since there is no queue. Okay. Are there any more questions about this? Okay. So this is installed um, by, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at my cluster at the same time. So this okay. is uh, installed by default. Uh, where do we fall into this? So we fall into the catch all today. I mean, we work with that and right. our, our own client side rate limiting does something to uh, impact our performance. I guess I'm trying to understand the difference. Um, let's see. So like the case of a, a user that is, that is uh, let's say listing VMIs like crazy, the concern is that if we're in the catch-all and say the user's in the catch-all, the noisy user can completely overwhelm any of Qvert's requests to the API server. I see. That's the concern. So essentially doing like what the way that, Q, the way that Kubernetes could protect this control plane now. So having a way to something of a higher priority, higher precedence that we could make sure that Qvert's requests aren't going to be affected by anything that the user could possibly do. 
I mean, it could just be that we end up in workload high, and that's just what it, that's that could be reasonable. Um, but really, the idea is just so we avoid any sort of collisions with someone else. Okay, I'm interested in your data. It sounds like you have some tests or something. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So things that I should understand. I also checked that my cluster. It has just workload high, workload low, and the high has, you know, forty concurrent. Uh, well, yeah, forty forty concurrence. Maybe it's thread go. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what is this. And the low it's one hundred. It seems that the low is higher than the high. <laughs> I, I I don't know what what we should expect for these numbers. You know. And why they call high and low here? Um, so um, let me see. I think it's priority or um, let me see. So the 40 shares and then low and then where's the, um, the precedence? Does anything even use workload low? No, it doesn't look like it. Oh, yeah, service accounts get workload low. Um, it could be how they measured it. I mean, yeah, I mean, because I, I see you're saying like you see 40 here and it's lower than 100. So I'd actually yeah. get more priority. I should the... maybe should expect the, the opposite, isn't it? like uh, the high 100 and the low 40. I, I don't know what they mean with high and low because this looks like the same. Uh, Except yeah, from this, weird. I, uh, share. I'm not so, sure what they mean either because this is um, maybe the there's a load, like a, a, a small workload, so it gets more shares because it doesn't do as much. I don't know. Uh, the the I mean, this is the highest that, that is here, except for this one. Yeah, I don't know what they mean by low and high here. Yeah, I'm just be speculating. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just confusing yeah that's no, fine yeah okay um so the testing that i did uh, was focused on trying to like understand like what different cues cue lengths um hand sizes and, and how they affect different things so um i have a few sort of assumptions that go into this so one is that I, during this testing, what I did was I disabled the client side rate limiter. Um, and then the second thing is that I never see the API server get completely overrun. The memory and CPU does go up significantly, but it doesn't get completely overrun, uh, which is good. That's what's expected. And then I had some, I highlighted some things that I thought were, were interesting. Um, one of the things I saw during this is that um, during the tests, um, there was, um, a lot of, um, or eventually over time, the tests, like the the latencies went down for the APIs uh, or for the for like the different verbs like list, for example, uh, for get and other things. Uh, things just got really fast, and um, I noticed this by when I went through the the API server logs, and I saw like the how um, how much faster um, etcd got during this. Um, it was. Well, you know, from caching or something, it was significantly faster going from, you know, almost, you know, 300, 2000 milliseconds all the way down 900, 500. It gets really quick over time to the point that um, it's actually interesting uh, how it how it does this, but you know, based on the load. So here's kind of what I did. So I have 600 lists per second of 50 VMIs. So I'm just doing a, um, a get request in a namespace, it gets all the VMIs. This is pretty expensive. Um, 600 per second is extremely expensive. So the concurrency limit for this is calculated. This is a Prometheus metrics. I, I grabbed it, it's 178. Um, it's the same for all of them. Uh, I did a by namespace um, uh, flow control. And then here's what I had for the priority level config, 20 priority. 10 queues, 20 length, and hand size four. Um, so I had a bunch of metrics. Um, I built like a little dashboard to kind of look at this. So, and this, this is basically what I pulled from it. Um, 
I do see that the we get 180 uh, requests per second that go through. Uh, it eventually settles down at a much lower rate. At least that's uh, that's what it shows. We see a, a queue wait time at 1.5 seconds that becomes nothing uh, over time. Our request execution time was very high at first. It goes down. Uh, rejected requests. Um, so this returns. I believe it's a 409, a 429 that gets returned from from this. Uh, we were getting a ton of rejected requests at, uh, at first. Eventually, it completely goes away. Um, and this happens when the queue gets full. That was uh, so it's one of the ways it can happen. But this is what all these were: is the queues were just filling, and um, we're getting rejected requests. Um, dispatch 350 per second. Eventually, settles down a little bit lower. Um, the number of in queued requests. Uh, 19 uh, gets down lower. List latency, um, like I was talking about, it was or during this time, it goes up to 10 seconds and it even settles down around eight. Um, and you can kind of see from some of the dashboards, like initially during this time period, you, there's just an explosion of requests. And then it's just slowly, slowly, you, slowly comes down increase, in this over time. Please increase a bit. Yeah. And this explosion of API requests, is this happening when you're starting all the VMIs? And do you have some sort of, it sounds like you have some sort of load generator or something that's just doing uh, list requests? So all I did was I have, um, I created 50 VMIs in a namespace. Um, I have a, a pod that's running on all it does is does a, a, a get, a get to, a get to the namespace, okay. get all the VMIs in that namespace. Okay. Uh, and it does it at uh, one pod will do it at um, like three per second and there's 20 of them. Is it, oh, my math right, 30 per second. Okay, per so second. we're seeing a, an increase in the queue length that happens, uh, just trying to get this clear, during the startup mm -hmm. of the VMIs while this pod is just issuing list requests. And uh, then we see it what appears like the, everything kind of sells down. Are we thinking that it sells down because the API or our Kubert control plane has settled down and then all the the pods list requests can just take more higher priority at that point? Or what's your theory here? Um, so the, what if, so the, I'm not sure if it's on, if it's us that's doing this. So the, when when so at first we we get we get a ton of requests um we start taking a little bit of time to to fulfill them uh it eventually gets a lot faster but i mean the time increase that i saw like was from from etcd like the response from etcd it wasn't necessarily from from our control plane at all but this is one this is an area that i need to explore more I, this is just kind of where i try to where i identified the the sudden speed or the massive speed up was was going to storage and coming back a lot faster. It might be caching. So after things settle down right. and there's no difference between all the objects, then it's able to return the same result. Yeah, that's that's what. Yeah, that's exactly the, that I was thinking. Is that like eventually is that etcd gets so overwhelmed with like okay, you just keep asking me for the same things. Like I'm just gonna have it ready for you. And it's, and it's coming back really quick. And that's that's what I was showing up here. Like, I mean, you can see at the start, we're as high as 2000 milliseconds from storage. And then we get as low as 299 milliseconds and the total time improves significantly while the, you know, the HCP response is pretty fast during the whole process. And the result is that How long our queues don't test? fill up and then we don't get any more rejected requests. What's that? So how, you you run it for twenty minutes. I ran this. It, how long did you run roughly, it? Roughly, uh, it took a little bit. What do I have in my timer here? So roughly, I let this sit. This one sit for an hour. Um, there's two dashboards because it's about an hour went by during this process. I think. Let's see, seven. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't tell. Maybe it was longer. Times just look off, but I don't know if it was about an hour. I have here. I'll show you the next one because I think I do. I do. I wait a little longer in each of these now because I realize that that's what what happened. So I show it a little bit more in test two. But you can see kind of the here's the API server. You can see how it's processing all these requests, but it's not overwhelmed 
it's not completely overwhelmed, um, which is important. Um, and we're still able to do lists and uh, we're, so eventually you can see when we're at eight seconds, we eventually settle down. Um, so that's good. So uh, I do a second, um, a second test. Uh, I increased the number of queues to 32. And I think hand size was four and out six. Same concurrency share. So currency limits 178. Um, slightly different results. Uh, we see a little bit higher dispatch requests, same amount of rejected requests. Rate limited queue time went up. Um, and queue requests went up. Um, so that makes sense. And we have longer queues. Uh, list latency eventually settled down much lower. So you can see this, this is just over one dashboard now instead of two. So you can see kind of over time, this looks like uh, it's about 25 minutes or so. You can see how, okay, we initially start, I, I'd already created the VMIs. I start listing 600 lists per second and eventually we, we come down. So the, to kind of like summarize like where I'm going with this, the, um, with the, uh, with Qbert, like have being able to per, sort of protect itself from, from a really noisy user like this, for example, uh, sort of trying to find the right balance of hand size, queue length, queues, and priority that that sort of fits. So what I'm doing is I'm just showing like the extreme case, um, or a few different extreme cases, just to make sure that, or to show how that this can things can be affected. And let me go down to test or where I do, or do I not have to? Oh, I only have three. I do one more test. Maybe I don't have it here. I, it looks like I don't. One of the tests I did with was um, was with three different flow controls. Um, so three workers, same amount of list requests, um, same, um, I think it was the same definition as test two here. And um, that was the best result that I saw. Um, I think I didn't, I think I forgot to copy over to this document, but I'll have to find it. But um, anyway, the point the point is, is trying to find sort of the right balance of this so that we don't, uh, so that, that the fits Qvert so that we don't get overrun um, by, by somebody else. So just, just try to understand. So when you say hi, is, is it the beginning of the test? And when we say settle, it means like the steady state, you keep doing the list and then it go, you know, it's steady state, just some, uh, some latency for the request or. Yeah, so or, the, when it goes up here, when it's very high, this is the moment when I start kicking off the list requests and the steady state, mm -hmm. which is sort of, I was surprised like this was I sort of expected the this level to sort of continue I expected there were no the number of rejected requests to stay flat but I think it's because of caching on the storage side is why we see like those those requests return very quickly um eventually at CD sort of is able to return things faster do you have face yeah yeah, we have the ATC it has a dashboard also, and it, it might be nice to see what's happening to your ATC. Yeah, I don't have, I it don't have some latency from it. and. Yeah, no, that'd be a good idea. I like, I pulled this from the, from the API server logs just to get a sense of like where, uh -huh. like, cause that's my, like, after I saw this happening over and over again, I was like, I figured I'd trace these. And so that's what these are. But I mean, I can you clearly see that there is something happening here that is causing the SD to return significantly faster. I mean, you can, it's littered with these, these like 3000 millisecond requests initially, and then eventually you see a ton of these and then so on. Um, and it's really fast, but I mean, it, like sort of, I mean, that's a cool thing to see. I mean, I think it's, but it's beside the point. I mean, I think the idea is that with 600 list requests per second, like a very heavy operation. I mean, there you can see how much the CPU memory explodes. It doesn't completely overrun the API server. It's still able to serve traffic. Um, and when I did the test with three different um, workers, 
they were still getting through. It actually had a higher um, dispatch request. It was somewhere a little over 400. Um, and so like uh, the number of workers that we had worked better um, in, in that in that scenario. So I, so, the, so the idea is like, if, if we were to define a policy of some sort, like, you know, whatever the queues hand size is, it's something we'd end up with something where we we take all the keyword components and we put them all together and they have maybe their individual flow controls but they have the share priority level configuration for Qbert, and then they have you know some queue length probably one of the ones you know like that, that i had in the example for kubernetes maybe we can copy that one or something like this seemed to work fine um and and that's kind of what we what we can use to protect ourselves from from somebody that's that's doing this um somewhere else and just to so make sure we're getting to the API server and make sure that none of our controllers also are just are, are doing anything that we don't want them to do. Can you uh, create an issue on uh, Qvert Qvert, link this data and I think the issue should be, um, I think we should auto generate some sort of flow schema uh, perhaps and make that something that the eight or i'm sorry the operator is capable of installing maybe uh, based on our data it, it's kind of an investigative issue but um it would allow people to find this so to find your data easily and maybe it's something that we can automate at some point in the future if it makes sense yeah i agree i, I think there's still yeah I, I think there's still sort of um some investigation. I, I like, I, like, there's a lot of still, still open questions. And yeah, so it, it makes sense to me. Like, a, for instance, like another area, we could do, we could even do flow controls um, per API or per verb and per API per user account. Like, there's a lot we could do. And like, one of the things like that prevents us, like, if we say that, if we know, for example, that list is heavy, we, we do know that. Um, we could isolate lists and then we could let create go through, you know, have it be processed separately so that we can make sure there's fairness between those list requests, not, you know, blocking any of the, um, the create. So there's, there's like a lot we could do around this, but um, yeah, I think we can start with a, uh, an issue and then, then maybe um, as we get more data or something, mm -hmm. like, I, I kind of want to start a milling this discussion and we can kind of get some consensus on like what we think this should so here's the scenarios I'm seeing this potentially impacting us. So we're talking about like lots yeah. and lots of nodes and lots and lots of vert handlers. Uh, vert handler is going to be calling lots of lists and watch uh, on yeah. virtual machine instances. So I could see in a kind of failure scenario, for example, let's say um, half of a data center has a power failure and we're bringing all those nodes back online. Uh, if we had a flow control or something that gives uh, vert handler uh, precedence, then it might be able to bring up um, all of its uh, virtual machine instances quicker um, because it would be able to do um, get the lists uh, cached and everything quicker. Uh, yep, I think it's that, that cool. scenario. Like we if could get, it could be that scenario, David, or like in the case that there's that, that huge outage and also in those we have a ton of those list watch requests it doesn't completely take down our control plan as well yeah mm -hmm. or yeah so it doesn't, doesn't completely take down the APS or yeah sorry go ahead marcella no when we do an update in the cluster also for for example a newer version and it will also you know do a bunch of requests Bias and kind of things. Yeah. So I uh, so for next steps, like you said, it I think it makes sense to me. Like create an issue, we can get some attention on this. I think there's still I need to do some more tests because there's like a lot of different ones I can do. I I want to do like a one that's a little more granular, like with another 600 list requests, but with like maybe 10 different workers and see how it performs and just to get an idea. And then maybe we can try a few tweaking with the hand size and the other one and the, yeah. the queue, the queue length a few times and maybe we can get an idea of how we can perform in a few of these scenarios. Yeah, and the idea with the, the GitHub issue is yeah. not necessarily that we have to solve something immediately, it's just discoverability of your research uh, okay. as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. And, and also, if you can include the, you know, the other, um, the catch all, you know, what's the difference between the catch all and with the example that you did to see if it's, uh, how much it can be, you know, mitigated or improved. Configuring that, it will be nice also. And my last yeah. comment, it's about the TCD. The TCD thing, you know, seems to be too slow. Like the TCD documentation says it's the latency should be under 10 milliseconds. And you are 300 at 2000 milliseconds. Well, are you in so a nested environment? It's so, definitely too high. Ryan, uh, no, are you running that's... cluster app or something? How would you use No, not, not for these. Really? So this was tested on bare metal? Yeah. Oh, it's way too high. I would say. Well, I, I, is the TCD running? You know, separate from the VMs in a, with the master nodes, something like that. Um, or it, it. Yeah, I think that's in its own VM. I think it's so. What's it, what's generally is it like ten milliseconds? You said. Yeah, 10 seconds should be fine. It's what I'm seeing also in it, my It could be this you know, request. I, I don't know what it is on the on the like the normal request. Like it I don't know what the baseline is normally because like so for example, like this case, like this mm -hmm. um that I'm showing here, like these these logs only show up in the API server when they're really slow. Like when they're over a certain amount of time, like I think it's five hundred milliseconds is the the, the baseline. So there are other requests in here that are faster. It's just they're not here. Okay. Um, so I don't. So I don't know. High. I don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're seeing the high ones. We're seeing the slow ones. There's a latency uh, metric. Maybe, maybe you had that in your dashboard. I just missed it. But you could do the P99 uh, or, or whatever of that. Yeah. And I think, they also see the average. And see how yeah, that I think that's what Marcel was asking. I don't have the etcd dashboard attached here, but yeah, I mean, that, I think that's a good one to at least have to show. Um, this because we would expect to see this to at least decline um or at least maybe to show up in the dashboard and, and even see the average I, I mean if you're not running on yeah. a real-time kernel or something like that i would expect to see collisions just because of there's other things running on that server and every once in a while it's not going to return fast or whatever that, that could just be cpu scheduling even if mm -hmm. it's under load yeah. Right. It's still yeah, three I mean, again, seconds. Thousand that's, meters. That's that's really yeah. Like, it's too, ah. too too bad, isn't it? <laughs> two thousand. Yeah. Two thousand no. <laughs> milliseconds. Yeah. Or three thousand yeah, well, total. Mean, yeah. You could see like in, no, in yeah, here. It's too, too like, low. Yeah. List latency is is ginormous at this point. I mean, I don't know of the total list latency time. I've got ten seconds. I mean, we're seeing three seconds. I don't know where the rest of it is, but. I mean, that's pretty, that's a huge number. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean, this is one second, that's four total right there. Oh, sorry. No, it's no three total, it's a total. But the, um, yeah. So it's, yeah. I mean, that's, that is slow. But I mean, there's a lot of requests that are going on at this time. So that's why I was like, I kind of expected this, but I, I don't know what it is at baseline. So that's something I could check. Can we, we have like 15 minutes left. We have a few more items. Did you want to move on? I think you have the next yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Well. I think we covered that. Yep. I think we're good. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go to the next one. Um, BMI specific metrics. Do we want to? I have a million to start for this. Do we want to talk about like this for maybe um, two, three minutes here? Is there anything? Um, or do we want to just cover it in the thread? Do, like, do people have anything they want to add to this? Or we can just take it through the thread? Whatever. It seems like we're looking for some very specific cases for stuck VMI. So it's, uh, are we stuck um, from the creation to running? Uh, and then maybe in between there, is it stuck between scheduling the scheduled or scheduled to running? And then are we stuck between uh, termination and finalization? Like maybe um, it's tough to, <laughs> it's tough to represent that just in, phases maybe i don't know I, I had trouble just trying to figure out what 
maybe maybe define uh, let, let's collectively define what a stuck what we're trying to solve here or detect here what what is a stuck PMI I know we had it on the um, mailing list but maybe we can just hash through that real quick yeah um, so this, this, to me the stuck a stuck PMI is something that is um, is not progressing um, past the phase whatever phase it is like it's just not it's not moving uh, it's been there for and, and sort of the to quantify it, it would be like is you know we we expect you know vmis to go through pending in less than a minute and this one's taking 10 minutes um that's how it quantifies something as stuck okay so i think we can represent all of this given once we get your um your deletion histogram in there i think the collective of all the metrics that we have, we can represent this. So we would want to be looking at phases, uh, phase transitions that take too long, specific phase transitions, so scheduling to scheduled. We'd want, if that takes um, too long, like we come up with some sort of threshold, then that's, um, well, the thing that's tricky here is we won't know about stuck VMIs until after they're unstuck. Yeah, well, so that's why I was thinking, <laughs> We use we could use we could use the creation time as like plus like the number of phases. Like what I'm what I'm assuming is that if we had some if we knew like if we had an estimate of like um like I'm thinking we use n ten times sort of as the threshold time as like okay if you have if you've gone through this many phases and we just you know make an assumption that they're whatever amount of time per phase and then um, it's been this long since creation then there's a high probability that you're stuck. And that's like, and that's how we define unreasonable transition time thresholds. It's like, say I said the 10 minutes, whatever it is, it's like, okay, he's gone through this VM has gone through three phases and it's reached its 10 minute mark or whatever, you know, 10 minutes plus the three phases, maybe a minute per phase. So 13 minutes, it's, it's stuck. Like, you know, that's, let's report this as, you know, as a, as something that's stuck. I don't know, something um, David, like that is what I was thinking. David, can't we know, like you said, we can only know after it's unstuck, but we record all the phase transition timestamps. So we can still know if, if you know the order of transitions, which we should, we can still look at when it switched into the previous phase and how long that took, right? But if, if it doesn't change the phase, so that'd be that'd phase, be current you know, time minus for example, the, the previous time stamp, if it's, right? Yes. If it's scheduling, okay. If if it's scheduling and it's never changed the phase, you, you don't know. It's yeah, but you don't. Yeah, you also don't like know when to look. Hours, no, days. There. This, well, I, yeah. I mean, I guess we might be getting too much in the details, but it's it's sort of the when. When do you look? Like when do you? Well, I mean, I guess that's the same problem with creation if you use the creation time, because when do you look? Yeah, it's, it's actually the same problem. It, if it if it doesn't get an update, it's it's very hard, isn't it? So when it's stuck, if you, you cannot even watch it because it's not update, it will not show up in the event. Right. <laughs> We would get no indication. Yeah. And so all this is definitely possible. Uh, we can tell this. I'm just trying to point out, I guess, by my line of questioning is that I can't figure out a practical way of doing it. I mean, it can definitely be done. It's just not falling within the patterns that we've already established. So what I, what I think, um, yeah, for example, ports do. I, Maybe it's not directly looking at if the VM is stuck, but we, if we can kind of come up with the reasons why a VM is stuck, and that should always cause an, an error or an event, and that can be recorded. Like if a pod can't launch because of no resources, you see it in the pods events. If it can't launch because of the volume is taking forever to mount, you see it in the pods events. And maybe that's 
something we already do or we could do or look at more that we find or know all the cases why a VMI gets stuck and recorded there. Or if some of these events happen and we know that it was, you know, stuck the VM, we should move it to fail phase, you know. Maybe I, what's happening is, you know. Well, so you we, we still process the key, right? Like we still we still are running it through the work view every time or no. Or we, we don't sure. because we don't have any we, events. We do. The problem is that when the VM uh, is stuck, let's say it's stuck in scheduling because the pod, uh, there's just no way for the pod to be scheduled right now. Either you've asked for a resource that doesn't exist or whatever. It's going to keep, like the scheduler is going to keep trying to do schedule it but if it's not writing any sort of update to that pod uh, then that's what would queue up the vmi so if something is writing a condition to that pod or something anything then we would re-trigger the reconcile but if it's not then we're just never going to look at that vmi again uh in the reconcile loop is which also means that our monitoring wouldn't see it because we're looking at the yeah. same uh, informer callback yeah, there's sort but of two. So for deployments and stuff, same same situation, right? I think that's expected. Must have one update. It it Edit. yeah, it will get an update if the pod can't be scheduled. We should update the VMI saying what the pod is saying why it can't be scheduled, but then we shouldn't touch it anymore until it the pod is scheduled. Right. Mm. Yeah. We are dependent on the life cycle. And then it will be point. stuck there. But and I don't well, mind it's something flying, that uh, happens uh, with Paul, isn't it? It's yeah. an open issue. Yeah, that's why I said there that. is no way generic. to fix that right now. And, yeah, it's generic, generic problem thing for and, and Kubernetes uh, problem. <laughs> right. I see. Yeah. And an admin might want to look at stuck resources in general. It's nothing specific to us. That's why I suggested to find a way to look at it for all sorts of resources. But for us, it's just, I think we're doing what we're supposed to do in, in, in general. So here's why I would recommend as a path forward uh, for you, Ryan, if this is something that you're going to research, figure out how we can detect uh, a stacked VMI and what that means. And don't worry about necessarily how to report it or anything yet. Just figure out like, how can we practically determine like, how, how can our code detect this thing is occurring? What would that involve? Would it, does that sound like a, like a, a good, at least action that can be taken? Yeah, I think what I, the assumption I was making is that we were, we were still getting events to these pods, but now it's clear to me is that there are cases that we're not. There's so no we actually, that's the yeah, yeah, no that, yeah, that's the problem. So that's, that's what, I, what I'm missing. So I need to, right. We, I need to figure out if there's a way around, a way to like to deal with without having a guarantee here. I okay. think we're getting events, um, but we're not getting updates. Events are a separate object. Right. So there it's might not... be events we can listen for, but it's not, yeah, no watch for events, just. Okay. Okay, uh, that's something I can research then. Okay. Okay. Um, sounds good. Okay, next one. Um, record VMI deletion time. This is the PR that I was working on. Um, the only open question that I had just wanted to bring up was that um, finding the right sort of end post to to like record deletion. So like right now, um, the way that I was looking at it is that we we use the we so like the removal of the um, of the finalizer. As like the endpoint, um, one of the assumptions that I was making, and I just haven't had a chance to check this, um, is that when we're removing the finalizer, or when it's been removed, we should that we're in a failed or a succeeded state because the pod has exited. Um, that's what I was going to look to implement. I tried it; it didn't. I didn't catch any though. And so now I'm, I tried also just catching on if the finalizer is removed. Uh, I didn't see that either. Um, 
So I'm not sure. I'm not sure where what uh, where I could go with with this. If, if if there being no finalizer on the VMI, the new VMI object, if that's the right ending to record delete time. What, let's see, what are you trying to measure? Are you measuring the time from deletion to the time that the guest is shut down within the pod? Or are you worried about the time of deletion to the time when the pod actually shuts down? Those are two different things. So the uh, deletion would be the time when, so the pod, oh, when the pod shuts down, that's when we pull the final answer off. Yes. So yeah, it would be the time that the we see the deletion timestamp. So that's when we process the control plan is processed the delete request up until that to the pods removed. You can measure accurately right now uh, the time from deletion to the time that the VMI hits a finalized state. I believe. I think that's possible because we have a finalizer on the VMI that will guarantee that the um, Vert controller uh, component will see the VMI one last time before uh, it is deleted. If you're right, trying that's to, the, that, there's that's no the, guarantee about the pod thing. Well, the pod thing is in like the pod being removed or? There, what if there never was a pod then, it, for example? Well, that or what you're well, getting is exactly oh. when the, Cumu process is down, not when the pod's down, which is I mean, that that's accurately for how long it takes for the VMI to shut down but not get deleted. It's kind of does that distinction what, make sense? Yeah, like I want to when the VMI is deleted because there are because I've seen cases where the pods are moved but the VMI is still there. I'd rather we continue to measure if this VMI is still there because that's that's kind of our interface. I don't know how you're going to get when the pod's deleted, because once the finalizers are removed, you may never see that object ever again. So you'll never okay, see the update come in. That's the yeah, problem. that's what I'm seeing. <laughs> okay, that's that's what I was saying is that I'm checking, I because once what Qvert sees that at the last moment, I think it's like that is final function. It checks like okay, is this, and then it removes the finalizer, and I was hoping I could catch the events of the uh, the object being updated without the finalizer, but I'm not catching it. No, that's the end. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I need hey. to catch it right before that. In the like with the is the is final. final will give you the best the closest you're gonna get to it. But it's not a guarantee, but it's the closest you're gonna get to representing what you're trying to get. Yeah. Okay, so it's not a guarantee. So what would be a better representation if I'm not <laughs> the only way you could do this that? is put a new finalizer, another finalizer just for the monitoring, which I do not what? recommend. Which would mean that you're, <laughs> you would look to see if you're the only finalizer left. If you're the only finalizer left, record this and then remove okay. your finalizer. Are you Don't explicitly interested in the pod stuff? Because uh, what I noticed yesterday was I delete a VM um, and the VMI created stays and succeeded for a notable time until it gets removed. And the way you can measure that is um, the watches give you a type deleted events type, and that is really the last time the object existed in Kubernetes. And if you look so at I, that, I you get the last state before it actually was deleted. The last state before it was actually deleted. Uh, as far as I know. Well, what about, okay, well, what about, um, so the, forget the, the deleting the VMI then, because it's, because well, so I could do what you suggested, um, Kevin. But we'll, we just won't forget for one second. Like, if, what about the pod? Like, so I could get the deleted event on the pod. I mean, is that even going to get me? Like, or what's like the what would be my ending time if I were to do try to get the the when the QMU process ends? Like, yeah, when, I, I want you to understand why or if you're explicitly interested in the pod. Or not the VMI or yeah. I was so I was interested mostly in the VMI because I thought that made the most sense because that's like the object that's like our interface to tracking this. But maybe it's not possible. I mean, I, I don't think like in terms of the use case, like I think I think both would be okay. I mean, I think it's just like I mean, I think as long as we clarify what it is that it's measuring, I think it's fine. It's just mostly what I'm after is like what what's the right what's the way that we can have some sort of guarantee. 
you can I mean, measure what, what do you want to know well here's here's what uh, let's just focus on what you can actually measure right now and that's deletion yeah. timestamp to a finalized phase you can measure that you can even measure the deletion timestamp to the actual deletion from kubernetes why the watch can delete you? deleted event are you right? not guaranteed to get that though yeah i don't no. think you're gonna get it i thought you are okay uh you might get it you'll probably uh, uh, i mean that's that's one of the edge phases i don't know yeah i, I don't know if you're gonna get it the that's the whole I, reason the finalizers exist is because yeah it, you may exactly. not get so, like, that deletion Okay, so I think I need to go to that is final state. Then I need to. That's what I need to tie into. Then I can't use the finalizer. So that would be a. Yeah, that would be close enough. Okay. Yeah, I mean that, that seems like that's achievable. Which is kind of a, a new, like a, a new, um, you know, when, when you get the finalizer deleted. And then you get like the Prometheus metrics there. Is that is that everything? Instead of have the, the watch that you were doing. So because when it's deleting the final all the finalizers. So then you can do like the timestamp there. Yeah, I mean let me let me play around with this a little bit and um, see if I can have a path forward here. All right. We're 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 over time here. I mean, do you can we cover this in like one minute or should I save this for next time? One minute. Yeah. I, I just wanna know. So what's the status here? I see that we have a periodic job that's running today, running the perf stat. Uh is that accurate? Or the say, Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, but we, we didn't export the, the dashboard yet. Okay. And what's the plan moving forward yeah, with this? It's, it's... Yeah, so the, the plan is uh, to exp to do this dash and also to have this new um, right now uh, nested virtualization in this in the CI. Um, but we want to have this uh, the cluster that I'm using for the, the benchmarking that I was reporting to actually run the test. And even uh, we are using the, the test with the functional the well, the functional test that creates 100 VMs, but the idea is to move that with the load generator plus the the tool that you you created. You know, the perf uh, perf perf prof. I don't remember now the name. Yeah, but... yeah. So we don't. Uh, yeah. So, oh, so yeah. We, do we not have any? Uh, do we have any thresholds set today? No. For the periodic. Oh, we don't have any thresholds for now. Yeah. Okay, got it. No. So we, yeah, are, no. it's just, just running. Yeah, it was like a Roman actually um, request to remove the thresholds from the PR in the beginning, just because he, he mentioned that we could first just check, you know, the, the executions. And then we, 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 we have the thresholds. Especially because it's it's actually running now in the nested virtualization, the CI/CD, co-located with all the jobs. But yeah, next week I, I will try to prepare you know the the infrastructure and, and have it like <clears throat> uh, move move forward with that. But definitely the idea is to um, replace the the job that we have now with the tools that we are creating. Yeah, but so, like, I, I, I'd prefer if we can get what we have at least usable now and have like the dashboard so we can look at it while we move it over. Because I, I, yeah, would that okay. be good to to? I like the idea of exporting that? the dashboards, and I'd like to see us export the perf audit results without the, the threshold, yeah. so we can get the results and begin uh, using that to kind of understand what we would want to actually set the thresholds at. For our environment and you said marcelo mm -hmm. that you want to move the cluster or something let me make sure i got that straight we're running in nested mode right now but you had a dedicated environment or something what was it yes exactly so it's so we're right now like a in the as the regular functional test which it's uh 
running the CI, you know, uh, kubevert CI, and the kubevert CI creates a uh, VM and kubevert inside, a Kubernetes cluster inside and run kubevert. So, uh, and this is nested virtualization that it's creating, and also it's it's run the 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 function test in a shared cluster. Right. But um, I, I'm going to uh, introduce a new cluster. Um, actually, we already have the machines. I was doing some tests, but I need to actually release that for the our convert CI you now. And and then it will have like a, 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 Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster always running that runs the, the perfect jobs that we want. Um, yeah. I will configure that with Federico here I'm back before. So just one last thing. I, uh, I, so because I, I before that I was just yeah. I was just gonna ask. No, I just the, why I didn't create this cluster. Right. Uh, Go on. Sorry, I, I just wanted to summarize real quick. Uh, where where is this being tracked? Uh, these changes so we can um, uh, at least get some sort of. Where, where can I go to, to figure out how, um, what's being worked on with this and the progress that's being made? Do we have that? Or... Um, I have, have it in Red Hat issues, but uh, um, okay. I, we should, I, yeah, I should create like a, an external, um, an issue in the covert repository describing that, isn't it? So I, I will do that, yeah. It's it's not, it, it's not open yet. Yeah. For mind, if we are actually running those tests right now periodically, I'd like to, or I'd, I'd prefer to get something from them first, I guess, prior to get the dashboards and to get the Grafana and so we can do something with them. Um, because right now they're running oh. for nothing, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. and, um, and move on from there. I don't know what you other think, but mm -hmm. that would be my preference. I want to see something <laughs> finally. Yeah, uh, uh, we can need to double check, but I think it's already been collected the metrics. Um, but uh, need to see what's happening. Yeah, I will. I will follow up on that, guys, and I will update that as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I, I might be able to add the perf audit results. Let me. I'll add that to myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, that went over a little bit, but I thought that was important just to kind of understand the progress here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Have a good